Hi everyone, I'm David, I'm a wedding and portrait photographer from here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I've had a lot of people actually asking me about how to, how do I correct my images in Photoshop and how do I know which curve to actually use in the red, green and blue curves when you're actually dealing with things like colour correction in Photoshop and even things like Final Cut or Premiere. So I'm going to actually take you through a presentation now, uh, actually how this works, because I thought it might be really interesting to all of you. It is going to be a little bit of theory at the beginning, but eventually it will make sense to you especially as we get down near the end and you'll understand why you do pull a certain curve in a certain direction to get your color correction done. So let's go over to the actual um, presentation itself um, because I'd love to take you through this. Now it's just color theory and I've said it's for photographers and videographers. Um, it doesn't really matter whether you are a photographer or videographer, it's the same process for, for all of them. So what I thought we'd start looking at is how it actually works and we, I thought what better place to start looking than how the eye actually works uh, itself. So when we go to this next um, screen here you can see that the eye is made up of a number of things. We have the iris here uh, and the lens at the back. This is sort of similar to your aperture in a camera. At the back of the eye itself um, we have the retina uh, all the way through here and the fovea is directly at the back and that's where your clearest vision is right at the back. Now your clearest vision also has the, the largest number of cones. Now we have uh, something called rods and cones which I'm going to explain to you uh, in a second. Um, the rods basically are for low color vision. These are the things that you actually use when it's at uh, night time when the um, when your sun has actually gone down, the rods take over. Now your rods cannot really remember color or see color very, very well. They see more things in like a, a, a black and white or very low contrast type color. They're designed so you can see in the evening. For instance, if you try to look at a red car or something like that, or a yellow car, it's very hard to tell what the color is in the evening. You look at the color of your car, say in the daylight, then have a look in the evening and just see how different the colors actually look. And that's because you are using your rods rather than cones. The cones are basically at the back of the eye right here and they're used for your high color definition and it says down the bottom there that your cone receptor cells are of three types and it's red, green and blue and as we add this up it'll all make sense to you um, what's actually going on. Um, now here we have rod cells, you've got roughly 125 million of these rods, uh, they produce black and white vision. Um, and they cannot uh, basically uh, see color very, very well at all. They're basically just for your black and white. And they function in dim light and your peripheral vision. Uh, that's how that works. Your cone cells, you have roughly 7 million of them. And they're the things that you see which are red, green and blue. And they are actually uh, mostly concentrated in the fovea, which is the back of the eye up here. That's where they're actually focused from. Um, so we, like I said, we have ones that are red, green and blue and I'll actually prove this to you later on in a little bit of a, a test that I'll give you. Um, another thing that I actually wanted to talk to you about too is if you are serious about getting into colour and, and I taught um, this colour theory for years in university and I want to basically make sure that you understand that we, there is quite a lot of people that are colour blind and they don't know so you should go and have a test done if you are uh, worried about that. I had a guy that used to get his greens mixed up with, with all different colours and reds and stuff but um, if we look at it, it's basically the inability to distinguish one or two uh, or more of the three colors, red, green and blue. And the ability to see color exists in only a few vertebrates, including humans and other primates, and etc. Uh, fish, some birds uh, and some bees. Um, and also an interesting fact too is if you're male, the color blindness affects about 20 times more males as it does females. Um, so I've, I've Grab this little thing from this S. Ashari, I think her name is, or his name, I'm not sure whether it's a girl or, or a guy, uh, but it's just used to illustrate. Now, I'm not, uh, look, don't take this as gospel because th this is just as a screen grab. Um, you should go and get a uh, full on um, screen blindness test from an optometrist if you're worried about this, but I just thought I'd give you a, a look at how these tests actually work. And th this is how they actually work that when you take the test, basically, um, if People with normal uh, vision and deficiencies will read the number 12 and obviously if you can't uh, see that number 12 well then you have a, a deficiency. Uh, the second one, the one in the middle, if you read 3 instead of 8 you have a colour deficiency problem. And the one on the right hand side too there is if you read 4 or a 2 instead of 42 you also have a colour deficiency problem. And when you do these tests they have a book that has stacks and stacks of these so you're able to uh, look at all these different ones that you can have tests done. So it's certainly an interesting test to have done. 
Also, another thing too, which I can't sort of um, say to you strongly enough, is that you have to be very careful about the mood and the lighting that's surrounding the object that you're trying to photograph for if you're trying to correct for something. Say for instance you had a red top and you brought that home and you put it down on a, on a desk and you were trying to match your photograph to that red top. If that colored top is, is surrounding by other colors and things like that, even the color of your room can affect it. And I'll show you how that works because when we look at this, for instance, um, the, the dots in the middle are exactly the same color. The outside has changed and it looks like the one on the right hand side is much lighter than the one on the left hand side. It's not, they're both the same. It's just the surrounding is different. One's white, one's black. Um, if we look at the next one down here, again, all of these are the same color on the left and the right, but it just shows you how different that they look when you look at them on the right hand side as against the left hand side. So again, it's just a surrounding color that's, that's making this look different. Another thing here too, it's the same with the green dot. The green dots look different, but again, they're both the same. Uh, if we keep scrolling down, you'll see that this is the same as well. It's the same green dot in the middle. Uh, just the surroundings have all been uh, changed, which makes the color look completely different. And that's why I'm saying you've got to be very careful about how you view the colors you're trying to match. And again, you can see that here, the top one with the grays look different and the bottom one, the greens look different because they're in a, um, in a different color background. Another thing too that I used to give um, students was this color test. Now I can't do that with you here obviously, but I used to hand out some of these color swatches and they had to try and remember which uh, color that was uh, later on when I bring up this um, swatch chart. And, and what this proved was that you can't memorize a shading of color. Basically, you can remember that it's pink, but you can't remember what shading it was. That's where you've got to be very, very careful. If you're trying to memorize a garment, and remember, th this doesn't almost matter, but if you're photographing uh, garments for fashion, for instance, and they want that color to match their garment, you've got to be very, very careful on what you're actually matching. So don't just take it on what your memory was, because you won't remember the shading. You'll remember that it's red, but you won't remember the actual tone uh, that that is. So it's important to grab an actual sample. Another thing too is never take it gospel when people ask for things like, yeah, I just like it red. Because in the Collins Dictionary, red is the just got the color of arterial blood. Uh, blue is the clear, uh, the color of clear sky. This is why you just can't take uh, color terms. You've got to use things like references and their PMS charts and spot charts or, or percentages are things that you actually have to take as a measurement if, if you're trying to memorize color and you haven't got the original article. And what you would do, for instance, you can get things like these Pantone color books and you can measure that Pantone color book against the garment or the car, whatever you're trying to get. Get a close, it's really, get a color that's really, really accurate to it. So when you go back later on, you'd have something that you know is, is close to that color that you can match to uh, for your image uh, much later on because sometimes color accuracy is really really important. So let's have a look at how the visible spectrum affects all of this and how it actually works. Why do you see the red, green and blue uh, colors that you see and how do your cones react in that? So white light basically comes in and you can see it's split up and I'll show you this in a second in a prism but you'll see it's a mixture of red, green and blue. When those colors are mixed together in equal amounts you get white. And you can see that if you look through a prism. Basically, if you look at this, you can have a window shade or something like that, and it's got a small hole in it. If the concentrated light coming through, basically then you'll get it split through the prism and you'll see the red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and blue violet light uh, over in the corner, how it separates. Uh, that's You'll see that, and I see that even in my window with light coming in in the morning. It comes through, I've got a, a vase that's sitting on the top of the window shade, and it does look a little bit like a prism, the, the glass at the bottom, and I get a perfect um, uh, rainbow on the other side of the room, and I get that every day it's sunny when that light hits that bars at a certain intensity. Um, again, if you're looking at the visible spectrum, you can see here that it's only a very, very small part of the whole spectrum. Uh, if you're looking at it um, through here, uh, when we bring this up, you'll see that the actual spectrum of light is actually only this tiny portion that you can see actually through here. All right, so that's the only part that you actually see. So you can see it's a very small section of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So that's a really interesting thing as well. Um, if we look at it a bit further down, again, you can see here in measurements that uh, your light is actually between 700 to 400. Um, and the longer waves are things like radio, TV, radar, and infrared, they're harmless. But as you go to the other side, the shorter the waves, 
which are the blue waves, end up being X-rays, gamma rays and cosmic rays, which are very, very dangerous uh, and will kill you actually on that side. So the electromagnet, uh, the light spectrum is only in the center just here. So it's a very, very small part of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. So let's look now at how this works. Um, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to build some color wheels and I'll tell you which one to print, which is the M one, uh, because we'll use that when we do the color correction in the next um, video, which will be uh, in a few days time, I'll post that. Um, so let's look, we start off with the absence of light or it's black light. Um, so basically you're starting out with nothing and we're going to add that. That's why this is called the additive synthesis. So when you're looking at it, if we start with black and then we just add yellow, uh, red, sorry, to this. So we've got red and that's an additive primary and it's a third of the spectrum. Um, we also have green. Remember we've got red, green and blue. The green is a third of the primary as well. And uh, the blue is also an additive primary and it's a third of the spectrum. Now what happens though when we start to mix these um, these uh, colors because basically if we mix a red and a green together uh, you will get a secondary color now the interesting thing is as we start to build this up it'll make more sense but if we have red and green and we mix them together we get yellow so we've got red plus green equals yellow and the yellow is an additive secondary color the secondary colors are really important and I'll explain that in a minute where you'll use them for uh, again if we've got blue and we've got red together uh, the mix that that will give us is uh, magenta. So we've got red plus blue, your two additive secondaries, will give you a secondary color, which is um, magenta. If we come down to here and we have green plus blue, that mix together will make cyan. So again, um, you've got your additive secondary color, which is cyan. Your primary colors are red and green. Now. When we have all three of these together, as you'll see here, that we have the red, green, plus blue, once we mix all these together, this gives you your full spectrum. Um, if we look down here, you'll see that your red plus green plus blue gives you white. So that's how you actually get to your white. If you have a perfect mix of these, you'll get perfect colors. Obviously, if there's tones of this, you'll get balances or, or spectrums between all of them and shading. But you'll see that your red plus green gives you yellow, your magenta plus blue gives you, magenta, uh, sorry, red plus blue gives you magenta, and blue plus green equals cyan, and the mix of all three gives you white. This is the one that you need to print off, because this is the most important one that we'll be using for your color correction curves later on. So I will give you time later on to print this, like I'm saying, print this off before the next exercise that I do in a few days, because it'll help you understand how we're correcting uh, for the color. But the reason why you would do this is, if, for instance, you had green, if it was a green top and it tends to look a little bit warm with, with magenta, this is telling you that you can pull magenta out in your curves. So you would use the green to pull magenta out, you would use the blue to take yellow out of an image, and you'll use the red to take cyan out of an image. So if you, if you wanted to remove a little bit of cyan, if it had a cyan color cast, you would use the red. If something had a yellow color cast, you would use the blue. If something had a green color, uh, magenta color cast, you would use the green. And like I said, I'll actually show this to you and, and I'll demo it uh, actually live so you'll actually see uh, me doing it. So make sure you print that off before we do the next task. Um, again, we've got red plus green equals yellow, red plus blue equals magenta, uh, green plus blue equals cyan, red plus green plus blue equals white. And varying intensity of any of these colors will produce continuous shading of the colors in between, uh, obviously. There's one color that's not in the spectrum, and I, I, I'll show you this here because it's actually magenta. You can't see magenta in the uh, spectrum at all. Uh, you'll never see it in a rainbow, for instance, because to make magenta, the two colors that you need to mix are red and blue. That will give you magenta. If you're talking about it in a, uh, in a, uh, on a rainbow or something like that, the red and the blue are at opposite ends of the spectrum. They can't mix, so you can't see magenta uh, in the spectrum. I just thought that'd give you an interesting uh, insight. Now, I'm going to prove to you that your eyes have... Uh, receptors that see red, green, and blue. So I'm going to show you something in a second. You're going to have to concentrate on it. If you can, look at this on a big screen and try and not blink uh, when you're looking at it because it will prove to you how your eyes actually work and how they do have cones that are, are receptive to red, green, and blue. So let's start out with the red. So what I want you to do, I want you to just stare at this red 
uh, circle here for around 30 seconds. Try not to blink if you can, really concentrate very, very hard at it. And then I'm gonna bring up a white dialog uh, box that you'll see with no color on it and you should see something that actually happens. So let me keep that going for a second and just concentrate on it. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to this other one and you should see something. It might take a few seconds to actually appear but you should now see something coming up. Now you should basically have seen, if we look, I'm gonna bring you back to this color wheel up here. So we were staring at the red. Uh, when we stare at the red, that will leave um, the yellow and the green together. So because it's yellow and green, your, your eyes are being very stressed with looking at red. As soon as I took that red off, your, your red cones relax. The green and the blue then take over. So you will see cyan. So you should have seen a cyan circle in that uh, white box once I got rid of the uh, red box. Well, now let's try green and just see what happens. So just stare at the green. And again, do the same thing. Try and not blink. So the longer you stare at this, the actual better this result will give you. So I'm gonna take that off as well. And again, we'll come back up here. So we were looking at green. Sometimes if you blink too, it, it brings it up a little bit stronger. Um, now what happened this time was your green was being stressed. So your eyes were very, very stressed on, the green cones were really, really stressed by just staring at that green for so long without blinking and just, just concentrating on it. The second I took that green off, the green relaxes. You had your red and your blue came into play. So you should have seen magenta as a dot in that white area. Again, we'll do this with the blue. So again, you've just got to concentrate on this. Now, can you guess the color that you're actually going to see? Be interesting to see if you can work this one out. So again, let's switch over. Sometimes you can pause the screen too. You could pause it at that uh, location and try it. So again, we were looking at the blue. So your blue was being very, very stressed. Um, you had uh, the then the yellow and the green come into play so you should have seen yellow when you were looking at that um, dot now let's try all three of them because you, th this looks pretty cool as well when you see it you should see all the secondary colors coming into play uh, in a second so again just stare at these Like I said, the longer you look at these, the better it will be. And sometimes, like I said, you could even pause your TV screen uh, when you're doing it. And then you should see your cyan, magenta, and yellow. Uh, again, you'll see those secondary colors that were in here. Now, the interesting thing about this, though, too, is that these colors, if you're looking at them, um, this yellow, magenta, and cyan are your printing process colors. So that's how you actually get your printing colors. Uh, that's how scanners used to work and still do if you're talking about dealing in the printing process. Um, that's how the printing process still works when you're dealing with printing plates and, and actually printing off, which is cyan, magenta, and yellow. If you open things like cereal boxes and things like that, you'll often see the color bars at the top will have your magenta, yellow, and cyan. Often they'll have other colors that are used in the printing process as well, but they're your main colors that are actually used. And like I said, when we go through the color correction uh, in the next video, that I show about this, you'll see how we're using these colors, these complementary colors, to do your corrections uh, that we'll look at, uh, which will make sense. So make sure you print that out to look at the next um, uh, video that I put up when we go on this color um, theory uh, tutorial for the next one. All right, guys, well, thanks a lot for that. Let me know down below if you found this helpful at all and if you find it interesting. It certainly should help once we go through looking at how you manipulate the curves in Photoshop and also uh, things like Final Cut or, or Premiere or things like that. It would all be the same. Um, so we'll look at that um, uh, next time. Um, it's been great, guys. Hope you give me a big thumbs up and, and share if you can. Uh, I've really enjoyed doing this and I hope you get a lot out of it and hopefully it'll help you uh, move along and, and help you learn how to do a little bit of colour correction with uh, some experience. So that's all for now guys. Catch you later and I'll see you again for the next video. Bye for now.